Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Autistic Tidbits and Tangents podcast. Um, So this episode, we're going to be talking about parents with autistic children, kind of where they get their information from, what they really should be told, um, and and just what's difficult. And we'll, you know, we're just going to start and we're going to see where that topic takes us. (laughs) Yeah. We're going to shoot the breeze. Yeah. (laughs) So let's go. Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. (laughs) Cool. Trigger warnings for this episode include mentions and discussions of ableism, organizations like Autism Speaks, and discussions of cultural differences that we may not fully understand because we are white people. (laughs) Okay, so we kind of started off with just thinking parents that that get a an, an autism diagnosis for for their child um sometimes it comes out of left field sometimes they kind of know a little bit about autism beforehand but most of the time it's it's kind of like something's going on with my child some professionals get involved and then all of a sudden you have this autism diagnosis and then it's kind of like okay well what now um, and sometimes one parent is aware and pushing for investigating and one parent Definitely. just thinks, oh, they're a little bit immature or they're just like me. I mean, that's obviously a big one too, because so many parents might also be autistic and not diagnosed. Well, very hereditary, <laughs> is it not? Highly, um, highly genetic. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know what it's like in, in Canada, but um, obviously in, in Denmark, uh, despite having a very robust um, social security system. Um, once you have the diagnosis, a lot of parents do tell me that, that they're just kind of left with nothing, or maybe they get like, um, an hour, um, presentation about autism, or sometimes they're given a few hours of, of chatting with a professional or attending a course or something. And then that's kind of it. And certainly where I'm sitting on kind of the the private sector and the more specialized sector, what I can see is that the information they do get is, is it tends to be a little outdated. (laughs) So I'm very often sitting here and kind of updating them on what do we know about autism since the (laughs) nineties? because that's still where the public sector is at. Yeah. So what do you see in in Canada? So I I've been fortunate enough as a teacher to have worked in two different socioeconomic areas in the in the public school system. And when I was in a wealthier demographic area, those parents knew how knew were better at navigating the system. It's still not easy. There are still so many hoops. You really have to know who to contact. There's bureaucracy mm-hmm. everywhere, all the red tape. Um, but generally, they were more aware of what was available and accessing programs and services. Definitely. I currently work, and I have worked for about the last decade, I think, at mm-hmm. a school in a lower socioeconomic area. A lot of my my students are first generation Um, English might not be the first language in the home. And for many of those parents, I'm the first person connecting them and their their children are, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12. And I'm the first person who can kind of direct them to things. And so the knowledge base is going to be different. You, you have families who have done the research, not necessarily autistic led, Mm -hmm. um, And you have families who don't have any information at all, or maybe there's a cultural stigma or, um, you know, there can be a lot of shame where, where autism is seen as bad behavior in their, their home countries. Uh, I had, I had one family and one of the reasons they came to Canada was because of that, because she knew her son wouldn't have the quality of life and, and there, there would be so much judgment 
right. from friends and family. Th- this is actually something I, I hear. Th- this was a couple of years ago. It might be different now. And, and I'm very sorry if if what I'm about to say is is um, is prejudiced. Um, but what I do hear is that in, in Asian countries, there is still very much a stigma about you know, your child having any sort of handicap. And very often, um, as I was told anyway, um, and there's, there's this perception that it's like, it's the mother's fault. If there's something, um, quote unquote wrong, you know, even, even Eastern Europe, I was in was my building. Yeah. I, li- I live in a condominium apartment building and there's a, there's a pool at back and I was in the pool and, uh, you know, an older gentleman was there and somehow we got to talking because I don't know, everyone talks to me. I just have one of those faces <laughs> You and, do. <laughs> and, uh, we got onto the topic of autism. I talked about my brother. This Mm. was before I had my diagnosis and talked Mm. about my work. And he, he said, do you believe that it is caused by the sins of the parent? And I said, no, no, I do not. And he said, well, that's, that's a cultural belief in, you know, in East, in many Eastern Europe, European countries, I can't actually remember which country he was from. No, Um, but it, it, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem out of left field for mm-hmm. me to hear that it i i don't know, know any specifics though because i don't work specifically with with that sort of demographic mm-hmm. like we we do get a, a a wide variety but um i've i've only had i've only had a few clients that were not ethnically danish that's how we phrase it here oh yeah. god does that sound <laughs> racist that's the danish way of okay. phrasing it we we say ethnically okay yeah. so yeah Mm. Um, so yeah, certainly not <laughs> exclusive to East Asian. Yeah, no, no, I think there's no, many cultures, many cultures where they don't have the information and yeah. they have framed it in such a way. One cultural difference that always strikes me a little bit is the difference between um, Northern Europe and America. Um, so in in Northern Europe, we are very much in in the well, we're moving towards much more of a kind of um, there, there's a, a cultural mismatch between the culture that we have and, and autistic people's needs. Um, it's it's a it's a social handicap that is created between people. It's not so like the social kind of, model of disability. Yeah, exactly. That, the that social model. barriers. And mm-hmm. yeah. Whereas what I hear is that America is still kind of stuck in that med- medical kind of model and focusing on like how can we cure autism or how can we get rid of symptoms of autism mm-hmm. and i'm i'm wondering from your perspective i do hear that there's been kind of a, a push to to softening this but the work that autism speaks did you know mm-hmm. years and decades ago um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you think that has harmed the move away from the medical model. Um, I mean, okay. My students, maybe, maybe I, we should explain the medical, the medical model a little yes. bit. Yes. So the medical model is, um, based on the fact that to diagnose, to, to access a diagnosis of autism, uh, medical professionals look for so-called deficits. So everything is framed in deficit oriented language. um, And, and that positions it as something to be fixed or to be cured. And if we contrast that with the neurodiversity paradigm, which is the Mm -hmm. idea that um, autism is, is a type of brain, essentially. It's a, it's a different way of thinking. Autism informs how we interact with, experience the world, how we know things, how we express things. And it is, it's our reality. It's our, it's our lens. It's not something that needs to be fixed. It's something that needs to be appreciated and something that needs to be supported at times. Anything exactly, to add? Exactly. But, but, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Really good explanation. Um, and and neurodiversity really just being the idea that all brains are are different, but they're all human. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So the question: Do you think that that the work that organizations like Autism Speaks has done has kind of like 
held us back in that move? I think anytime we have information out there uh, Mm -hmm. that becomes really commonplace, especially if it's wrong, (laughs) it does, of (laughs) course, hold us back um, how it's framed. I I certainly appreciate as an organization that Mm -hmm. they have removed the word cure. They are trying to Mm -hmm. be more in line with how autistic advocates are asking them to recognize the humanity of all of us without person first, recognizing the importance Mm -hmm. of the identity. But certainly um, it has done tremendous harm. Um, It's really hard to undo ideas once they become commonplace. That's why we still have, you know, everyone keeps talking about Rain Man. And that was like, come on, that was what, in the 80s? We don't have better things to talk about. Uh, We don't have better examples. (laughs) What I, what I'm always hearing is like Rain Man. It's, uh, it's Sheldon Sheldon Cooper. Um, And then the bridge. I also do do hear the bridge. Yes. Oh, I love which, the bridge. We have to talk about that later. <laughs> I'm I'm a little happier when people say the bridge. I'm like, okay, that's that's it's better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when when parents are in that situation when their child has just had a diagnosis and and now they know they have an autistic child, what are some things that autistic parents autism parents really need to know what is the information they should encounter so ideal world i think it would be great if we had um each family supported and connected to someone like a social worker who could then connect them throughout the child's lifespan Mm -hmm. to different services different providers different sources of information because Mm -hmm. so many families have no access and don't know how to navigate systems, especially mm-hmm. if they, you know, the the English isn't their first language. If they're here, Danish and in, in, in Denmark, uh, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think it's really important that they, first of all, understand the impact of sensory and the, the benefits of like breaks and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think w- understanding how uncomfortable it can be in your child's environment and yeah. how to mitigate that and support your child is going to go a lot farther right off the bat than almost mm-hmm. any other intervention I can think of. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I think it does need to be broadened, of course. That, that that's me. I'm I'm never satisfied. <laughs> uh, I always want people to know more. Um, but but to to yes, of course, the 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 sensory sensitivity aspect of it, but also the social sensitivity, the the social difficulties that can come with autism, and then the processing speed. Um. Also, okay. One thought that that just made me think of tangents <laughs> uh, is. I mean, you give them the information they need in that moment, right? You don't want to mm-hmm. overwhelm the parent no, of, of a, a one and a half year old, two year old with, okay, when they are oh. 12 years old, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. they are going to really experience mm-hmm. a lot of social stigma at school, you know? Um, mm-hmm. So w- yes, we have to prepare them. We have to let them know the general experiences, um, but really focus on what the individual needs at that time, I think as well, which is something you'd already yeah. mentioned. Uh, yeah, we we talked about that before, before. starting recording. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm so the thing is, we kind of already have that model where you get a social worker. Um, there there is a shift because in Denmark, your social worker does change when you turn eighteen. Okay. So you have, um, and of course, it's a job that sees a lot of a lot of change in personnel. Mm-hmm. So even though you're supposed to have one social worker throughout, that's very rare. Mm-hmm. So what very often happens is that the resource aspect comes in over it, which is there isn't enough money to give all people access yeah. to the, the, the support they need Mm -hmm. um which tangent brings me to to thinking about the latest prevalence numbers from the cdc Mm -hmm. which um they do their prevalence numbers on on Mm eight-year-olds across the united states of america Mm -hmm. and and so they they kind of screen all of the eight-year-olds that they can come across um 
And they said the latest numbers, um, and I think this is from 2018, maybe I'm wrong. Eh. Um, they said one in 45 or one in 44, something like that. That's, um, that's but really they also, it, it's, it's an insanely high number compared to what we used to hear. But on top of that, they said um, one girl for every four boys. But when we then look at, you know, adults populations, yes. what we see is actually one woman for every two men. Um so we know it's of a course that, <laughs> this type of research does tend to to be very gender binary. So mm-hmm. I apologize for that, but they, they don't really take that into account. So mm-hmm. it is what it is. Oh, that's but, another but what, good point. It, it is. <laughs> but what it what it tells me though is that they don't have everyone in that eight-year-old segment because if if they still will think that it's four boys per girl then they're missing some girls. I would also um, say, and I wish I'd looked up this research so I could speak a bit more specifically, Mm -hmm. but when I was doing my my PhD dissertation, uh, Mm -hmm. I referenced two sources. So I referenced both the the CDC, the satellite sites with the eight-year-olds, which I think Mm -hmm. at the time from, from, it was like 20, maybe 2014 data, 2015 Mm -hmm. data, it was one in 59. But they also, um, there's another source that they use for autism numbers. And it's basically um, a representative survey that is, I think it's a, either a phone or a mailed survey to households. And yeah. when fa- and so it include it basically asks families to report, does is anyone in the household autistic? Yeah. Um, and so this accesses families who might not be um identified at school or at the at the in the medical level. Uh, and that was found to be one in 43 back then. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, okay. And so I, I found that really interesting. So that yeah. makes me wonder. I wonder what what the more representative survey looks like uh, yeah. now. I mean, th- that would be really interesting. But what it tells us anyway is that this is a huge segment of the population, and if everyone has to have access to support, then the resources need to be there to be available. Um, so not only do we need to have the right information available, Mm -hmm. but we also need it to be cheap enough that, that the the government funding can cover it. Social services need to keep up. There's no doubt. And, and that's, that's, that's a huge problem, a huge problem in every country. And, you know, there are other other disabled community members needing s- services, not just autistic um, children and their families. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, but that's a whole other issue. I don't have the solutions to no, 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 to, no. to money problems. <laughs> that's uh, not our job. Funding. <laughs> Ideal world, though. Ideal yeah. world. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the issue of whenever information has to be cheap, it's generally not up to date and it's generally not people who can really properly make a living from making that information available because Mm -hmm. when it has to be cheap, you just, there's, there's no way. Um, Yeah. So it's, there's, there's the, the human aspect of Mm -hmm. kind of getting the information that, that you should have and that everyone really has a right to have, but then also the, the kind of, governmental resource aspect of it which is it makes it really tricky it does now can we take a you know take off the hat we're wearing right now and Mm. put on our autistic hats what what would you have liked your parents to know when you were growing up well a lot of things (laughs) (laughs) I wrote a book about it we'll get to that we'll get to that later um no but I think I think the primary thing for me that I really would have wanted my parents to know was I don't have to be like other kids. It's okay that I'm different. Um, just let me be me and I'll be okay. Um, help me navigate through being different in a world that doesn't want me to be different. I love that. Um, what's what's I'm not even me, sure that's in the book, but yeah, but it's great. What <laughs> strikes honestly, me that, that's kind of the the summation of it all. 
my brother Danny was diagnosed. Actually, I mm-hmm. think he got his diagnosis even later, but my parents knew, um, uh, you know, he had some developmental delays as well. And so his support needs were a bit more obvious. Yeah. Um, I did not have, have a diagnosis growing up. And I think my parents did a great job with both Danny and with me and with mm-hmm. me, like they, and I wonder if it would have been different if I had a diagnosis, but they let me kind of march to my own drummer. You know, yeah. my my father had written a, a novel probably around the time I was 11 or 12 and he let me edit it. And so I like yeah. to me, they really nurtured my creative abilities. They let me, yeah. you know, write stories on the computer all the time. And mm-hmm. um, like I got to pursue my passions and, you know, I, I, I socialized sometimes, I certainly, but my memory, my best memories from childhood are things like, okay, trying to write the Agatha Christie style novel and, you know, editing my dad's novel and just having this writer to writer relationship with my dad and going to see theater shows with my parents, usually individually, they really made an effort to do things with each of their children, like as individuals. That's so awesome. Um, and that, that was really phenomenal. Like, I, I I take my hat off to them for that. Oh, definitely. That sounds amazing. That sounds so amazing. I think I think my parents kind of came from a more. Um, my dad's family was was kind of more of a tribe. Like they're really good together, and unfortunately, I never really got that close with them. Um, my mom. How do I put this? <laughs> um, she she comes from um, a culture where social norms are very important. Okay. And so for her, it was difficult that I was different. Mm. And I think she's grown to accept it a bit more. Um, her language is definitely changing it. I hope um, by this point she's accepted it. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. Well, I mean, she she oh. she was the one that that kind of pursued me getting a diagnosis, but she had a really hard time changing her language. Mm-hmm. So for the longest time after I was diagnosed, which was when I was 16, um, she would still she would still refer to it as there being something wrong with me, mm-hmm. and it took me I think it took me like. 10, 15 years to, to get her to understand that that phrasing Mm -hmm. was hurtful. That's something I see (laughs) in my work as well, because often, often parents and families are new to navigating the diagnosis. Sometimes parents have not told their child. Mm -hmm. And so I'll give them advice about this because really Mm -hmm. how parents and guardians frame it yeah. is going to impact how we as autistic individuals feel about that label and feel about ourselves. Ultimately, um, I've I've worked I, with parents who, um, you know, again, sometimes it's misinformation. They don't know. They think it's a disease. Um, mm. The way they talk yeah, about it's, it, it's matters. The, it's a medical. It's a medical view lingering, kind of in in the way we talk about autism, and. I don't, I don't blame people for it because that's what they've been taught. That's what they've heard. And, and that does get internalized, not just for some autistic people, but certainly for everyone else too. It it is kind of that way of, of just, it, it is not the norm. It is a diagnosis. So it must be wrong a disease sad something to fix if you're saying it with like gravitas and like extreme like you have autism you know (laughs) it's it's really going to impact the the person hearing that it is um I think for me it it much more so impacted um my self-esteem and my self-worth rather than 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 it being connected to autism I very much rebelled against that way of talking about autism from the get go. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was that kid that like, after I got my diagnosis, I didn't understand why I shouldn't tell certain people. So yes. I was just telling everyone and yeah. being like, well, the way you're going to react to me telling you that I'm autistic is going to tell me whether or not you're worth me knowing, mm-hmm. you know, like 
if if you if you're uncomfortable about it, mm-hmm. you can ask questions. But if you're mean about it, or if you are rejective of it, then you're just not going to be my friend. Mm-hmm. And so I did Make that for dry. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> I think that was the good part about my autism profile is that yeah. I'm very like logical. You're very logical. Well, <laughs> I guess it is logical. Um, but it also meant that I could reject the part of the way that that I was talked about that had to do with my autism. I could reject that it had anything to do with the with the autism, but somehow it still got stuck on yes. like my personal identity. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. And so that's, that's definitely left some, some stuff. Uh-huh. Um, but I think, I think there's a huge aspect of how our parents hear about autism and then yes. how they communicate it. And especially and, and when professionals uh-huh. are stuck in that old narrative, uh-huh. then our parents are going to be too. And I mean, that's not to say that medical professionals shouldn't prepare families that, you know, outcomes vary, but they shouldn't just say your child will never have a job. Your child will never go to university. No, 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 no. You, (laughs) but you can say, you know, outcomes vary and, and, but your child's an individual and we'll nurture them where they are. Yeah. And if you are as a professional, if you are talking to a family uh, with a very young child, um, say two, three, four years old. You can't predict. There are so many things about that child's life you're not going to be able to predict. Um, even, I mean, yeah, you can you can do some testing, sure, but so many things can happen for that child in their development. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you have, as you very often do with the social profiles, the socially motivated profiles. Mm-hmm. Um, the masking profiles, I guess, you very often have a child who is 12, 16, 17, or you even have an adult and you're talking to that adult about how do you, how do you talk to your family about this? Mm -hmm. Um, As was in your case. (laughs) Um, And I think, I think it's in those situations where as a professional, Yes, you have to definitely talk about what is what is this specific child, what is their profile, what are their support needs, and support the parents on that process of figuring out what the child's support needs are. Um, but also being very mindful of knowing that you are teaching these parents, how to talk about their child Mm -hmm. and how to talk to their child about this diagnosis. One of the things I often say to families is not to be afraid of the word autistic, right? Like, you know what? I I understand if they, um, if they use person first or identity first to me, I'm not, I'm not, um, it doesn't affect me as a person hearing either. I, mm, but if someone yeah. uses autistic, I feel like, yes, they, they're they pretty comfortable. That's good. Um, yeah. But we don't want kids to think it's a dirty word. So you can't be afraid no. to say the word. You, It's a word that really validates that we see things from our, our autistic lens. Yeah. And so, I think too about labels, like we, we have other identifications that people have no problem using identity first language for like gifted my gifted child or that gifted student why 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 then are we afraid to say autistic do that with a lot of other handicaps yeah the deaf community is one that i can think of yeah they definitely disabled uh, many people prefer disabled as yeah and that's that's all perfectly fine so i think for me it's very much about the tone that it's delivered in Uh For me, it's it's always kind of like, are you saying, oh, this person has autism? Um, or, or this person's saying, autistic. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can mm-hmm. use identity or person first language in a derogatory manner. Mm-hmm. Good point. Um, and that certainly is happening in Denmark, um, mostly with kids. Mm-hmm. Kids are using 
Um, so the the way that the Danish language uses these words is a little bit different from the English way. Interesting. So so we don't say. I mean, I've started forcing myself to say the literal translation of autistic person or autistic people. Um, but most people in Danish actually say autist. Oh, I like that. Um, yeah, but <laughs> I don't really know how I feel about it. But anyway, the, the word autist um, has become... A kind of a, a bullying word. Isn't it amazing schools? like how in general what kids mm -hmm. use to bully others and what adults use to bully others tend to be identity is. identity markers. Yeah. It baffles yeah. me. Absolutely. But I think I think that the the whole like identity first person first language is definitely a point to cover with parents. Like talking to them about it's okay to use whichever form you should know that most autistic people tend to prefer identity first language. And so your child may grow up to prefer identity first language, or they may not. And it's okay. And, and it's okay. And if you're not comfortable with either language form, that's okay too. But just know that there is a diversity in how people prefer to be talked about and to, mm -hmm. and, and all of it is okay. Um, there isn't, you know, there isn't a hard and fast rule about no. how to talk. It's just much don't more talk so... about it only as a negative. Don't, don't exactly don't it's say, about... oh, that's your autism showing anytime they're doing something wrong. Exactly. It's yeah. about, it's about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's about the, the intention and the, the content of mm -hmm. the message. And I think that is, that is really key. And I think um, most parents would really be open to that. I think like I, I think so can too. understand how scary it is to have to readjust and reimagine things and get information that you weren't expecting. Um, I like, I have a great deal of compassion for families, especially mm -hmm. families who are left in the dark about what to do next and where to access supports and what those supports should look like and who are getting different information from different sources. And how do you know what's valid? Right? How do you know who to Definitely. trust? And and it's so difficult as as a parent who hasn't encountered these diagnoses before, you know, any diagnosis really, when your child gets a diagnosis, you don't know how to be critical of your sources. Mm -hmm. You don't know. You are completely reliant on meeting good sources. And and having them inform you and of, expecting that that the sources are are going to want the best outcome for your child, just like you do. Like parents yeah. are doing the best they can and Definitely. wanting the best for their child, but there are of course sources where you know uh, yeah. I'll be your doctor and I'll sell you all these supplements and like oh if they're mm -hmm. selling something you might want to run in the other direction. <laughs> oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Um, I mean, for me. I think one of the one of the things that really hit me uh, when when I got more into kind of the the autism field was how much information is provided by professionals and academics and parents. Mm -hmm. So it's not autistic people. At least when when I started, you know, finding information and, and becoming a part of this community, um, and and becoming a part of this field, most information was not provided by autistic people, mm -hmm. and I, I definitely do see the shift happening mm -hmm. with with influencers and with with autism advocates and you know people really working to make this. <sighs> you know, a, a, a more even playing field in terms of where the information comes from. Though I wonder how much that information is actually out there in the public. Cause you and I, of course, we, we're, we're always our, in our own echo bubble. chamber, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. so we're in the autistic community. We're hearing yeah. all of these voices. There are some wonderful Twitter accounts a, of non-speakers, really yeah. um, of people promoting non-speakers, but yeah. do people outside of autistic Twitter get access to those voices the same way. Yeah. And, and I do think, 
I do think that's a really good point because a lot of people, especially the the parent segment, because I, I think that young autistic people, when they are diagnosed and when they're ready to find information about their diagnosis, they are going to go to YouTube. They're going to go to TikTok. They're going to go to Instagram. Yes. Um, because that's what young people do. But the parents are going to go to Autism Speaks and to the National Autistic Society. And in Denmark, it's it's called Autism Denmark. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't I'm not lumping all of those organizations into one. Definitely, definitely no. not. They are very different from one another. And even local segments of those organizations can be very different from the main organization. Mm-hmm. So this isn't to to stigmatize any, anyone's work. Um, but for the most part, those organizations are not autism led. Mm -hmm. And that means that the information the parents are getting is coming not from autistic people, um, but from other parents or from professionals and academics. And one of the problems with that, as I see it, um, it is hard to work toward uh, a future if you can't envision it. Yeah. So if you are shown certain pictures, but not not a wide variety, if, if you don't hear from non-speakers, if you don't see, mm-hmm. okay, there are a, a plethora of outcomes possible for my child. I should support my child where they are, help them develop talents, help them to yeah. have connections and be able to access help and ask for help in whatever way they can. Mm-hmm. Um, w- sort of what you, what you see is what you get. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that yeah, makes sense. <laughs> it, it does. It does. And and one of the things that, that always strikes me is like, whenever we do hear um in in more the mainstream obviously not in the um in in the autism echo chamber community um but like the stuff that actually gets out to the mainstream mm-hmm. um where we where we hear from non-speakers or even from autistic people of color uh-huh. um it's very often those stories that sell well mm. so it's it's, you know, oh, this particular non-speaking person learned how to type and look, look at how well they're doing. Isn't that so? And it becomes derogatory. It becomes yes. icky. It becomes that sort of feeling where when I'm watching that as an autistic person, I'm like, can you please stop? Because it doesn't, you're not meeting them as a person. It mm-hmm. becomes more of a spectacle. Or it robs us of our right to grow. So I yeah. forget who it was. Some some famous, I think, singer has an autistic son who got, went to university and got a university degree. And they were like formerly mm. autistic. They basically positioned it as he'd outgrown his autism. And it's oh, like, no. obviously you see change over time. Autistic people are going to yeah, change and-, and grow and present very differently, but they're, they can also do things. And yeah. when they do things, you don't take away the label and say, I guess you don't have the label, it, you know? <laughs> oh, and and I do, I do respect those autistic people that grow up and they, they do become symptomatically subclinical and their wishes in life are in such a way that they want the the diagnosis removed and they do get that diagnosis removed all respect to that if that is what you you want i i heard about one person for example who wanted to become a police officer but you couldn't get into the police academy if you had an autism yes. diagnosis and so that person went through a whole process of like how I'm do doing. i get this diagnosis removed because i want to be a police officer mm-hmm. um and I'm not saying where in the world this was, but it, this person succeeded and did become a police officer. And, um, and you know, I have so much respect for that, you know, when it's like, okay, this diagnosis and the stigma that comes with the diagnosis is getting in the way of what I want to do with my life. Yes. Okay, fine. Get rid of the diagnosis. It's supposed to help you. It's not supposed to hurt you, know, you and yet it, you and, it can and, and impede and your life <laughs> it's something um, i think about a lot as someone with yeah. neurotypical past well somewhat passing privilege mm-hmm. uh yeah it's like 
being open about being autistic could influence whether I get a job. It could influence my medical care. Um, But I also thought like, you know, my students should see models. They should see models of uh, autistic people from all walks of life, from all backgrounds. Autistics that have gotten somewhere with their life that they like. But even like, if they haven't gotten somewhere, like, you know what? I, I, no, but I'm, I'm not saying achievement. I know I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying like getting to a point in life where you are happy. Yes. And doing something that you mm-hmm. like, whether that is arts or an academic pursuit or yeah. a profession, like just seeing there is yeah. an adult autistic life out there that isn't only handicap and stigma and or super genius right like yeah or or one of one of my students always says like or elon musk yeah one of of my students always says why can't the media just let us be mediocre like why don't we have the right to be mediocre like everybody else? exactly (laughs) exactly and and most autistic people are mediocre (laughs) because because people are mostly mediocre mediocre, and that's perfectly fine yeah there's nothing wrong with that like we don't have to be you know we don't have to score very low on on cognitive tests or very high most of us score in the middle Mm -hmm. you know most of us don't have to be either really bad at fine motor skills or draw photorealistic art Mm -hmm. (laughs) most of us are somewhere in the middle Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and and I think that's an important point to get across to parents as well is that you know your child is autistic that doesn't say anything about their future yes just like any child they have the right to grow and learn and they are going to grow and learn and we can't predict the trajectory of their progress but if you're helping support them where they are and you're encouraging those interests and you, you are helping them to grow, they're going mm-hmm. to make progress. And, and they're going to grow and develop like any other person would. Not I, necessarily in the same direction, but all people grow and develop in, in some way. And one thing as a, as, as a family member of someone who has high, like significantly higher support needs than I have, my quality of life metrics have shifted a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing too, because we are so influenced by capitalism, by neoliberalism and the idea that you have to be be productive. You have to marry, you have to have a job, you have to be fully independent. And there is nothing wrong with needing help. There's nothing wrong with needing a caregiver. There's Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with, um, uh, not having a job, what matters to me, and especially when I think of my brother, like, is, is he happy? Does he have things that he enjoys doing? I think he probably has a happier quality of life than most of us because Mm -hmm. he goes to a day program. He really loves, he's learning all the time. He's able to engage with his special interests, which are mostly video games and talk about those things. (laughs) And he goes in for nature walks and like, that is a good life. It is. It is definitely. Honestly, it sounds kind of enviable. I know. <laughs> like um, here I am burning out and getting my diagnosis. And uh, <laughs> like I should just be doing more of what Danny does. Um, I was uh I was at a conference with Peter Vermeulen. Mm-hmm. Um and he said this very, very wonderful point that I think should be included in every presentation about autism from anyone, anywhere Mm -hmm. in the world. Um, And I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but what he said was basically autistic people are human first. There are more similarities between autistic and non-autistic people than there are differences. Mm -hmm. So Basically, instead of othering all the time, we need to think about autistic people as just people, Mm -hmm. just individual people with their individual needs and dreams and desires and hopes and interests and 
everything. And support them where they are. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that's a perfect place to end this. That was really beautiful. Thank you, Peter Vermeulen and Maya for for (laughs) paraphrasing. Um, I guess that brings us to the thing of the day. Thing of the day. Yes, thing of the day is Maya's book. What's it called, Maya? (laughs) My book is called What Your Autistic Child Wants You to Know and How You Can Help Them. Um, It is a kind of republication second edition of my first book, which was published in in kind of an an indie way, self-publication. And now it's coming out with a proper proper publisher, which is a little bit weird. I wrote some extra chapters. um, So there is more of it. It is a different book. It's been edited. It's been... It's gone through a proper (laughs) process this time. Um, It is a wonderful read. I, uh, I will, will be recommending it to the families that I work with. I, I love, I, I had the pleasure of having a sneak peek before uh, it went to publication and there's so much wisdom in that. And um, so much that I related to is someone going through late diagnosis Um, discovering my autistic identity. As I read it, I got chills a whole bunch of times, how much things made sense to me and things you put into perspective for me. So Mm. beneficial, not just for families, I think also for individuals learning about themselves. Thank you. I mean, I, that is kind of the feedback that I've gotten from the first version of the book as well, is that a lot of autistic people really liked reading it. Um, but I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the initial thought was, was that it was for parents. Um, and it came out of kind of whenever I went somewhere and gave a presentation or did a Q&A about autism, uh, I was always faced with parents that were like, we don't have time to read a book mm-hmm. about autism these these tomes that are recommended to us all the time they're huge they're four or five hundred pages long the chapters are 20 to 30 pages each we don't have half an hour to sit down and read in peace and quiet because we have an autistic child and there are support needs and and the child needs attention and we also just need to be parents and socialize and they're just overwhelmed yeah they're completely overwhelmed and so the thing that that got me started was like, okay, you need information about autism, but you need it to be brief and approachable. And so that was, that was the entire point of the book actually was to see like, can I, can I take all of these topics about autism? Like, yeah, like, you know, sensory sensitivities or uh, travels or homework or you know, food, whatever. And just frame it, yeah. Can I take all of these topics and push them down to somewhere between one and five pages? Mm -hmm. Um, And I do think there's a couple of chapters that are a little bit longer than that, but most of them are super, super, super Mm -hmm. short. Highly readable. Uh, Yeah, I I read it very quickly. Um, You should also do an audiobook version. I could listen to you talk all day. (laughs) Or people could just listen to our podcast. I mean, I mean, they could, yeah. if, if they wanted to hear me speak, they can just come here. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm here. Um, I, I don't know that I'm that listenable, but mm. I don't know. Yeah. I disagree. <laughs> I feel weird about compliments. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but I, I wanted, I wanted to do a book that was going to be useful for people. Yeah. And And that's, if this book is useful to one person, then I've done my job. And And where can they find it? Well, they will be able to find it anywhere that sells books online. Um, I don't know, obviously, which physical bookstores might pick it up. I have no idea. And I have no idea about libraries. Um, So I, I can't tell you about that. But I, I can tell you that basically anywhere online that you shop for books, you will be able to find this book. And if you are in the UK, this might not be applicable to people outside the UK, which is why I'm framing it like that. Um, On the JKP website, 
you should be able to get a discount using Jessica discount. King Kingsley Press. Is that right? Publishers. Pub- publishers. Okay. Publishing. Yeah. It, Jessica it's, Kingsley. It's, it's jkp.co.uk, I think. Um, but if you find the JKP website, you should be able to get a 20% discount using the code Maya20. So M-A-J-A 20. Um, and I don't know how long that code is going to be valid for it. They didn't tell me. <laughs> they just told me <laughs> about this discount code. So um, hopefully it'll still be valid. And if you're based in the UK, you can use that and get a discount on that website. But the reason it's probably not applicable for people outside the UK is that obviously after Brexit, (laughs) there are now import fees and such to get books in and out of the UK. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, And I don't currently have discount codes for any other websites. Um, If that becomes a thing in the future, I will be sure to post it on my socials. Um, or make a short video about it, or we'll mention it on here if it's if it's ever relevant. Yeah, great. Yeah. Um, topics change. Tangent. Uh, mm-hmm. We should say that every time we have a tangent, but then I feel like that will be every like tenth <laughs> word. Um, yeah. Okay. You and I talked about every episode having like a fun or weird question or something yeah. just just to do something a little bit different. So, mm-hmm. all right. Um, what is a really bizarre um, executive function strategy that works for you, something that gets you activated or doing something that you don't want to do or it's hard to do or hard to get started? What's one bizarre thing Uh, that has worked for you? (laughs) I don't know if it's bizarre, but I will, I will treat myself like I'm a really small child and I will just, I will seriously use candy motivation so um now what I'll what I'll do is I'll set really low bars for the things I need to achieve so when I was studying for example I would I would make little charts if I was writing and I would be like write 250 characters in the next hour (laughs) and 250 characters if you're if you're typing in in word is like two or three sentences at most. It's nothing. Um, But that would get me started because it was like, I I can, I can do that. And they don't even have to be good sentences. I can just do it. You know, it's a tiny, it's tiny. I can do it. I can do it. And then I would get those 250 characters done and then I would be on a roll and I could, I could get more done usually. And then I would have really good hours and some hours would be bad, obviously. And when I was reading, if it was a text that I really hated, which yeah. happens when you're in academia, you know, even <laughs> yes. if we love studying, sometimes you're faced with an article or a book that's just like not yeah. hitting the spot for you. <laughs> Relatable. <laughs> and I would seriously take M&Ms and put on the page, <laughs> like after every paragraph. I and when it. I had gotten to it, I could eat it. Yeah. <laughs> so those are, um, Yeah. Break it down into small bits and reward yourself. That's how I got my PhD done. I will tell you the same thing. I uh, I have a little works. trick that I use. So I I hate doing dishes. Oh, um, me too. And so then when it comes time to wash the dishes, uh, I will have to come up with different like dopamine hacks, whether it's, you know, mm-hmm. call a friend while you do it mm-hmm. or... Um, one thing or that put I on music. put on music or a podcast, yeah. another thing that I'll do um, just to activate uh, that same sort of uh, rush. Mm-hmm. If I'm in the kitchen and I'm like, okay, I really want to make a, a tea or I'm yeah. making a coffee. I'll look at the dishes and go, okay, let's see how many I can do before the kettle boils. So I'm not yeah. forcing myself to finish, but usually no. like you said, I get on a roll and then I continue, but yeah. I will, I will make it almost like a competition and then it activates yeah. that reward center. Yeah. And actually when you're making a, a cup of tea, you can get a lot done because you have the time until the water boils and then you have the time until the tea is done mm-hmm. like while it's brewing. That's true. So usually you'll end up having a good let's say five to seven minutes Mm -hmm. to get it all done. (laughs) 
Well, not to get it all done, but then you've done something. Yeah. And, and I and wouldn't I think, beat myself up about it. No. And I think it, it is important as, well, not just as a neurodivergent person, but like just as a person, there's a lot of information and a lot of stuff that we have to do as adults in today's world. And there's a lot of information that's coming in all the time. And a lot of people feel overwhelmed and end up, you know, procrastinating on small tasks or, or just feeling, feeling inundated by all the things that they have to do every day. Mm -hmm. And I think being honest with yourself and just saying, I don't have to get everything done all the time. Mm -hmm. My house is allowed to look like people live here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't have to look like the Ritz, you know, <laughs> mine does look like people live here. There's only one person, but it certainly looks like the clutter of many. <laughs> you know what? So I, I always, I will tidy whenever we're recording or if I'm having clients, because obviously this is, this is my office, but whenever I don't have clients here, it's about 10 minutes at most before my desk looks a mess. And that's because I have, you know, scatterbrain. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I need to have all of the information right in front of Visible. me. All the, mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's post-its all over the place, mm -hmm. um, different colored post-its <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's okay. That's I have all the drawers, drawers and closets of doom. Don't open yeah. that door, you know? Yeah, exactly. But that's, that's a part of. So if, if some of the people I know are very traditionally organized, so very tidy, very clean. And if they see my desk, they will be like, oh my God, that's a mess. But for me, it's comforting because I have the information here that I need. Mm -hmm. I do prefer that my kitchen is clean, but it hardly ever is because it takes a lot of energy to keep it tidy. And, and people so, live there. And people live there and that's okay. So I kind of like, I set a bar that is achievable mm -hmm. because if I'm constantly thinking that my house has to be you know, fancy guest ready, yeah. I'm always going to feel guilty. And I don't oh. want to feel guilty all the time. Yeah. We have to give ourselves grace and not treat ourselves like failed neurotypicals, right? We have to, even neurotypicals though. I mean, yeah, they're allowed to have messy it, houses. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's okay to not have your house look like you are a fifties housewife and you have nothing else to do, but to tidy your house and, and, you know, weed your garden. It's okay. We're people, yeah. we're busy. We live places and, mm -hmm. and life is messy. Mm -hmm. Life is messy. Life is messy. I, and I, I don't want to spend all my time cleaning the kitchen or anywhere else. I want to do those things, but I also sure. want to make time for the things that I love the things that I need to do to restore energy, the exactly. things that, that bring me back to myself and keep me grounded. Yeah. So it's about setting that bar that's acceptable. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, for some people that is okay. Um, if I need to, I can get it done in half an hour for, for me with the kitchen, it's like, is it smelly or not? <laughs> <laughs> that's your, that's your benchmark for success. No, yeah. <laughs> but, but it is, it is because no, I'm, I'm fine with, I'm fine with things being untidy. I'm mm -hmm. not fine with things being unsanitary. Yes. Right? Agreed. So, so for me in the winter time, it's obviously a lot colder and, and then it's not as important, but in the summertime, I want the trash to be taken out every single day because otherwise mm -hmm. it's going to smell. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's things like that where, okay, that's my bar. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be the same bar for mm -hmm. other people who live here, yeah. but it's mine <laughs> and it's, yeah, that's it. And then also to forgive myself because yes, there's the aspect of like being a failed neurotypical, but there's also the aspect of like, everyone has bad days. Mm -hmm. 
And it's okay to have a bad day or it's okay to have a bad week. Sometimes mm-hmm. life hits us with a curveball. Mm-hmm. And, often, yeah. And sometimes very often. <laughs> <laughs> and then things just don't get done. And that's okay. Yeah. It's okay to be human, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Life is messy, I think, is the, the, the title overall message. For, <laughs> for this segment. Episode two, Life is Messy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right yeah. well wow. that's it for for this episode we hope that you enjoyed it we hope you kept up with us and uh, let us know if there's a topic you are interested in us diving into you can reach us on all of our socials and usually you'll find me under maya Todale, and you'll find kara under dr kara diamond yeah so you know Write us, tag us, do the things. Do the things. Yeah. (laughs) Bye. Artistic tidbits of tangents.